poinsettias. Probably no other plant has, in, in floriculture, has more myth involved with it, more research. In fact, I probably have most, the majority of my personal publications, personal professional work over the last 25 years has been primarily with poinsettias. Um, it is, um, con continues to be the number one selling potted plant in floriculture, in numbers. Orchids passed it a couple years ago in dollars, but in numbers, poinsettias is still the number one selling plant. Uh, poinsettias makes up $256 million of that. So it is a major part of our industry. And this data is 2001. Later I'll show you some updated numbers. Just to give you an idea of and we looked at these numbers early in the semester, the first day of the semester, where uh, bedding plants is the primary part of um, this, this number. Uh, in 2001, bedding plants also include herbaceous perennial plants. Flowering pot plants is only a part of that uh, total picture. In 2011, the changes where we see bedding and pot plants is, bedding and garden plants is 34%. And why that's changed is because USDA uh, separated out herbaceous perennial plants up here, which is uh, the difference between uh, herba bedding and garden plants. These are annual sales, including vegetable transplants, annuals sold at the garden centers. Herbaceous perennials are plant materials like Plant Select, and this shows you the growth of, of that. Flowering potted plants is 16%. Of that, the majority is poinsettias. In 2001, USDA still, uh, they did fif uh, 15 states, or actually they did 30 states, and Colorado at that particular time ranked 13th in the nation in uh, flor uh, floriculture production of poinsettias. Um, the top one, is, of course, is California. Number two is North Carolina. And actually, with North Carolina, that's basically one grower. That would be uh, Van Wingerden Brothers family, Van Wingerden family. Pennsylvania, there's a Van Wingerden family there, too, but also a lot of other growers, smaller growers. There's actually a lot high number of small growers in Pennsylvania, followed by Florida and Michigan. But California, by and far, dwarfs and I've split this out into pot sizes greater than five, five inches and pot sizes less than five inches. And you can see where most of the market is. In um, 2011, a little bit of a switch. California is still number one. North Carolina is still number two. But Ohio is now in the thing. And this is green circle growers primarily. Uh, Florida, and um, which is... Um, a handful of large growers, and then Texas, which is Color Star, and their main subsidiary, uh, their main branch now is in Fort Lupton, so Colorado. So the, the numbers are kind of biased, but you can see right away that the market in the five inch diameter pots has gone down. It's all six inch or bigger, okay? Part of that reason is, is market drive or market demand. When you see a poinsettia for sale, and right now poinsettias are starting to bloom in the greenhouses, when you see a poinsettia for sale, um, where do you see them mostly? Where do you see them mostly? Where would you, if you went to the store, where would you not be surprised to see a poinsettia? I see them everywhere. I see them at the front door of Walgreens, I see them at the front door of Home Depot, every place. Everybody sells poinsettias. Everybody's got them sell, they're selling poinsettias for, for price points that are barely above, if not lower, than what they paid for them at the, guard, at the greenhouse for the wholesaler. Why is that? Bring in customers. Bring in customers as a loss leader. And it's being sold primarily as a loss leader. The larger poinsettias now are being marketed, and with more and more larger plants being marketed, what we're doing is going for a larger, more expensive commodity that they can make money on. Now, since 
the poinsettia is linked to cr Christmas, it goes along with a lot of Christmas myths. And I'm going to spend a good bit of time talking about some of the things that are attached to the poinsettia. And if you go to uh, Society of American Florists website uh, that's called allaboutflowers.com, and it tells you a little legend of the poinsettia. And most of the legends of the poinsettia that we hear are, come out of Mexico. And uh, this talks about Pepita, a poor little Mexican girl, Mexican girl that had no gift for the Christ child for Christmas Eve. And um, if you've ever been in Mexico during a feast day, you should go to a Catholic church just to witness the flowers and witness the devotion that the Mexican people have during those feast days. It's, it's pretty exciting. But she gathered up some common weeds because her little brother told her, says, it doesn't matter, the Christ child will appreciate wh whatever you give. Think of the little drummer boy. Okay. So it was her cousin, Pedro, excuse me. And when she knelt down, they exploded into this beautiful, brilliant uh, red color, which um, was thought to be one of the Christmas miracles. So from that day forward, we call the flowers uh, Flores de no Noche Buena, which is roughly translated to Flowers of the Holy Night. We know it as the poinsettia. It goes by a lot of different names in other countries. Euphorbia pulcherima is the traditional symbol of Christmas. However, it, it's used by um, people is long date, long predates the Europeans in this country, in this, on this hemisphere. The Aztec Indus, Indians used it uh, a lot. They cultivated it in the state of Morelos, uh, and I cannot speak any Mayan, I, I don't know how to pronounce Mayan words, so I'm not even going to try. And I, I can say Montezuma, and I can't say the other one. Um, they used it. Uh, quite a lot in their rituals. It um, was the name that it was given by the Mayans and the Aztecs was mortal flower that perishes and withers like all is pure. And its red color symbolized to them blood sacrifice and the blood sacrifice of their enemies. Okay, So that's what it represented to the Native Americans in Mexico. They use the red bracts to make a dye, um, red purplish dye. They would take and make a poultice and put it on your chest to stimulate circulation. They would crush it and use it for skin infections. Poinsettias have what we call as a letticifer. It's a secondary vascular system. That's the white sap, the, the, the sticky white sap and they use the latex to treat fever. It basically has no medicinal value. Uh, no medicinal value has ever been found. So it's just part of the uh, folklore medicine that was used. Now, when Catholicism moved to this hemisphere, the Franciscan priest during the 17th century near Tajo, which is outside of Mexi Mexico City, saw the plant blooming during uh, the Christmas season. and what they, what the, the what the uh, Catholic priests did when in every region that they of the world that they went to, they took local cultures and local uh, events and they linked them and webbed them in, and wove them in together with Catholicism and Christianity. And so they saw it blooming during the Christmas season, and they brought it into a feast day called the Fiesta of Santa Pesabre, in its in their nativity procession. Okay. And they used the concept that the Indians already had with blood sacrifice to represent the blood sacrifice of Christ to Christians. And it's, uh, in its native habitat, it starts to bloom in October. And it was used as a signal of the coming of Christmas or coming of Advent season. And that's how it was the Franciscan priests that brought that into the thoughts of, into Catholic uh, Christian Christmas traditions. So in Chiapas, uh, Siojo, Durango, Catalina, uh, these are all the different names that it goes by in different parts of uh, Central and South America. And actually, in Argentina, it's the federal star 
or the symbol of the Republicans during their uh, this Republican group in Argentina, and it's the national flower. So in Chile and Peru, they call it the crown of the Andes, uh, not to be confused with a tree that's called the flame of the Andes, which is this striking tall tree with bright red flowers. Okay, well, how did it get the name Poinsett, and how did it get into the United States? And there are a lot of things, you, you'll, you'll find a lot of literature written about a man named Joel R. Poinsett. And he's a very interesting fellow. And he was, uh, he spent a lot of his career, uh, he was a politician, did a, a House of Representatives, did all kinds of things. And he was the unofficial minister to South America and um, Mexico. And he was visiting and he saw the plant growing on the hillsides. Now in those days, if you were educated, and this is pre-Civil War, if you were educated, he was a southern planter, uh, you had education in medicine, you had education in Renaissance, you had education, you know, you had lots of education in um, uh, architecture, military science, all these different things. And you're pretty much what, what we call today a Renaissance man. And his, he had a good friend named Bar John Bartram, which we've heard named before, a nurseryman. And he sent the plant materials up to John Bartram as a present to all of his friends. And, and Poinsett at his home in the Carolinas had a um, greenhouse. And he would propagate them, give them to his friends. What makes the poinsettia what it is today was done by a man named Paul Eckie Jr. And we'll talk about Paul Eckie Jr. here in a minute. Paul Eckie the third is a CSU graduate from this program in horticulture business. So, Joel, who was he? He was a Renaissance man. He grew up in England. Um, his parents moved to England when he was a little boy. Uh, studied medicine. He was an architect. Uh, there's a couple of landmarks in South Carolina that he built. He built a church. He was a botanist. He was a trained botanist, a quite good one. He served as a congressman. And he was uh, primarily under President Madison, the younger, um, was the unofficial ambassador to South America and Europe and to Mexico in the 1820s. That's when he was down there. He was the Minister of Mexico under James Monroe, President Monroe. And during this time, uh, we didn't really have embassies like we have today. We, don't ha we didn't have um, ambassadors and such like this. But Poinsett was uh, actually considered to be a kind of uh, an annoyance to the Mexican government. And on Christmas Day, or actually Christmas Eve, he was escorted under armed guard um, to the Mexican border and told to get out of Mexico because he meddled so much. And there's a slang word or a slang adjective in some, in some parts of Mexico called, you're such a poinsentissimo. And that means that you're a pain in the ass, uh, basically. Um, that's the literal translation. <laughs> so he doesn't have the best record in the history books of Mexico. Persona non grata, uh, when he was under, under Monroe. Now, this is some other things he's done. He's already brought the poinsettias back to the United States. They really, they're just growing them. They, they don't really know what to call them. Under Martin Van Buren, poinsett was uh, appointed as a secretary of war. Like I said, this guy, um, he was fairly um, high up in these sorts of things. He was one of the first military men to work with rockets. He built the first powder factory, or he tried to build the first powder factory. And during his tenure as a Secretary of War, he increased the Army of the United States by a third. Joel Poinsett was then asked to settle the unrest of the Native Americans in southeastern United States. And his solution was to begin the Western transport of Native Americans out of the southeastern United States to Oklahoma, and we call it the Trail of Tears. Other things that he did that you might be recognize, he founded the National Institute for Promotion of Science and Arts, which is now what we call the Smithsonian Institute. 
other myths in poinsettias. 1919, uh, in Hawaii, um, a little girl was found dead in the backyard for no apparent reason. Now in Hawaii and in lots of parts of uh, Central uh, America and a lot of across a lot of the Caribbean countries, poinsettias are a shrub. It's a perennial shrub. And it grows, makes a pretty nice hedge. And it's tough. But she was holding a poinsettia leaf in her hand because they had a hedge of poinsettias in the backyard. 1919, they really didn't have a lot of tests to, to, to run to find the toxicology of what killed the little girl. So at that point, they said it had to be the poinsettia and it killed her. 66% of people today continue to believe that the poinsettia is poisonous. SAF is the Society of American Florist. Why is it considered to be poisonous? Well, there are a lot of reasons. It's a member of the Euphorbiaceae family. There are some Euphorbiaceae plants uh, out there that are toxic. Other types of uh, plant materials that are economically important, um, Hevea brasiliensis. Do you know what Hevea brasiliensis is? That's the rubber tree that we harvest for latex to make rubber. Okay. Manioc, cassava. Cassava is very poisonous. How many people like tapioca? You like tapioca pudding? That's cassava. It's poisonous in its raw form. It has to be cooked. Okay. Castor beans. Castor beans, ricin, ricinous, it's extremely toxic. All the same family. So people don't really argue about it too much. However, one of the things that you will note, and the data is, has not come out too much yet, if you have an allergy to natural latex, which comes from the natural rubber tree, you will be allergic to poinsettias. Will it kill you? No. Will it make you uncomfortable? Yes, it will give you a hell of a rash. Anybody in the room allergic to latex? Okay. So the sap from a poinsettia will give you an itch. That's what you have to do. So, no study to this day has ever shown the poinsettia to be toxic. Ohio State University did a research project a long time ago where they fed laboratory rats enough poinsettia leaves up to 50 grams per kilogram of body weight with no effects. That to equal the same amount of leaf material, a 25 pound child would have to ingest 250 leaves in one day to exceed the dose that's been fed to a laboratory animal to determine whether it's toxic. Poison control, 20, over 22,000 exposures a year. As reported, this is the most highly reported poisoning uh, incident to the poison control centers. 93.3% of those poisonings are related to <coughs> the re people request, reporting a poisoning are to children under two years. None have died. 92.4% have reported no ill effects except a stomach irritation. If you're allergic to latex, it's going to annoy your system. That reflects the number of people that are allergic to latex. If you read in the AMA journals of the Poison Control Center, because of the stomach irritation that it could cause, the treatment is a bowl of ice cream. A bowl of ice cream. The bowl of ice cream does two things. It coats the stomach and prevents the irritation. And two, it makes the kids smile because mom is freaking out. <laughs> Pets, on the other hand, if you've ever seen pet puke, uh, cat barf after eating on a poinsettia leaf, it will stain your furniture. I mean, it, it doesn't fit very well, and it gives them the squirts. 
Is it deadly? No. Is it edible? No, it's not edible. There are a lot of things out there that, are, that, are, that aren't poisonous that aren't edible either. Is it dangerous? No. Treatment? Ice cream. Plain and simple. All right. Trends. How do people give poinsettias? The season of poinsettias is earlier and earlier and earlier every year. In fact, there are breeders today working on poinsettias that are orange for what season? Halloween. 30% are given around Christmas or Chanukah. 30% uh, of all floral purchases is, is around Christmas. 26% is Mother's Day. 17 Eastern Passover, 16 Valentine's Day, small bit for Thanksgiving. 80% of the poinsettias are purchased by women, 51% for gifts. People feel like they get it, take something, when they go to a Christmas party, they'll take a poinsettia. Nobody ever brings me a poinsettia. Thank you. They bring me a bottle of wine. They know I grow them. I hired a student a couple of years ago to digitize my slide collection. He was just looking for a better grade. Hmm? Just looking for a better grade. Yeah. <laughs> 14,000 students. 14,000. No, 14,000 slides. Of that 14,000 slides, 20% were poinsettias. 85% of the Christmas gifts were poinsettias. 77% of the colors are red, pink, white, and peach. Gratefully, this number is starting to diminish with the funky colors. Man, there's some really wild breeding going on. But still, people like red. What do people want? Something else. And, uh, OFA this year that had Pr Princeton pink or something all over the place there. Princeton pink. Mm -hmm. Whose is that? Is that a, is that a Syngenta or an Eki? Um, I think it's a Syngenta. Yeah. That was the big thing out there this year. So here's a picture that I found somewhere. I don't know if it's from my collection or if I got final internet, but that's a house in Jamaica with a poinsettia hedge out front. Okay. So it is a um, shrubby perennial plant. Doesn't survive freezing temperatures. In fact, uh, temperatures lower than 50 degrees give it problems. It's got latissifers. Uh, they used to call it vital sap, but actually the latissifer in the Euphorbiaceae is a excretory function. It's a, it's, um, once the plant excretes its to toxins into the latex, it, I mean, it doesn't use the latex for any physiological purpose. Uh, maybe it's to protect itself in, uh, oh, from animal consumption or something like that. A lot of uh, Euphorbias in, in um, native Euphorbia species are toxic to livestock. Um, it was in the 1800s thought to translocate food like blood vessels, but it's actually really excretory. Um, it's, it's a nuisance. It sticks to your hands. It's tacky. Um, it's, it's hard to deal with. Um, if you're allergic to latex, it's going to give you an itch, um, but um, has no other benefit. The flowers of uh, Euphorbiaceae are formed on a uh, structure called, the flower itself is called a cyathea. And the, the, the cluster of cyathea is in the middle of the bracts. And that is where the blooms are. And actually, it's an anthesis when I want to sell, just before pollen sheds, when I want to be buying my poinsettias in the, in the, in the retail. And in fact, um, this, the uh, nectar that comes off the, the cyathea is, is very, very sweet to taste if you ever want to do that. If you're allergic to latex, don't do that. Now, prior to the 1960s, most cultivars were mutations of a, just a handful of selections. Um, the Mickelson family, uh, uh, we call it Paul Mickelson, um, and Mickelson was actually one of the breeder, the Mickelson company was actually a breeder up until the uh, mid to late 1990s. Um, 
they were very stiff stemmed. Uh, they, they held their foliage a long time. Um, before the 1960s, we, do, we were doing some seedlings, uh, but not too much. Most everything now is a rooted cutting. And in fact, you know, a little bit back to the Ecke Foundation, or the Ecke family. Um, during this point, uh, the first cultivars they were put into the trade was Ecke's Point C1, and it was developed by Paul Ecke Jr. Paul Ecke Sr. was a cut flower grower uh, in an area outside of Los Angeles that's now called, that's now named uh, today, we think of it as Burbank. And the, um, in the 20s or 30s, land was starting to get pretty expensive in Burbank. He decided to sell out and he sold out for a good chunk of change, and he moved his nursery operation. At that point, they were growing poinsettias in the ground, in the field, and selling them as cut flowers. Poinsettias make a very, very nice point cut flower, and they last a long, long time in an arrangement. So if you, could put, if you want to put them on a little orchid uh, tube or something like that, you could put them into an arrangement on a, on a, a mantle with uh, evergreens or something like this. It lasts a long time. But he was selling them, and the stems he was selling were probably three, four feet high, and it was all going for cut flowers. Well, they moved to the operation to um, the Encinitas area, which is about 60 or 70 miles north of San Diego, right there on the beach. If you want to have a fantastic internship in Southern California, the, this area of Encinitas has several large growers and some of the finest surfing in the United States. And sharks that jump out of the water and chew on surfboards. So anyway, so his son, Paul Ecke Jr., he sent Paul Ecke Jr., Paul Ecke Sr., to uh, the main floriculture school at that particular time. Uh, CSU wasn't quite where it is today, um, or even then. He went to Ohio State University and became a floriculture major. Went back to the farm. And at this point, they started developing the Ecke's Point line. And uh, Paul Ecke Jr. was a, um, an incredibly uh, alert and astute marketing individual. And he had friends, they still had friends in the Burbank area. One of those person's names was Johnny Carson. So what they did is they, um, took uh, poinsettias every year during the Christmas season on The Tonight Show, and Paul Ecke Jr. donated all the poinsettias, made sure that that stage was crowded with poinsettias. Okay, So if you go back and look at the old Christmas specials on The Johnny Carson Show, you'll see it nothing but poinsettias, and all because Paul Ecke Jr. got them onto the plant. Another program that really cemented poinsettias into the American culture was um, Andy Williams' Christmas Hour. And Andy Williams, uh, we lost one of the other crooners that was similar to Andy Williams yesterday or day before Perry Como, uh, passed away. And Andy Williams' Christmas Hour um, was this old home program. Everybody dressed, around, dressed in um, uh, their nice cashmere cardigans and this sort of thing, and with all the kids gathered around, saying Christmas stories and Christmas carols and stuff, the stage and the set was crammed with poinsettias because Paul Ecke Jr. knew those people and got those plants in there. So, the Ecke's Point, uh, it was a long-lasting cultivar. It was the first one that really long-lasted. It was the first one that naturally branched. And they could bloom it on a predictable schedule. The next line of uh, poinsettias that came around uh, was the Annette Haig, and it came out of uh, uh, Europe into the U.S. market in the 60s, about the same time the Ecke's Point came along. Uh, Gregor Gutbier in the, in the Germans, he started the German um, line, and the V10 series all the way up to the V14 Glory, which is still a major cultivar today. The Goot Beer V14 Glory became the major cultivar because it had very, very large bracts. And it could, those bracts would get so big that it would cover every grower mistake you ever made. 
because you could screw it up, look like the leaves would look like crud, because they did, because they had latex everywhere. The bracts were so large that it would cover up your mistakes. And it, came, it was popular starting around 1979 up until the beginning of this century. So now we have lots of families. The, the fr family that came from the, uh, the v V14 line, the next line was the Freedom series. And they're break, break, broken out into series. And what they do is the cultivar sport. This particular cultivar sports a lot. And there are breeders out there. Um, I mean, Paul Ecke has a PhD breeder on staff. Um, she's extremely talented. Then we have the carousel line, which comes from, uh, was originally Fisher, which is now owned by Syngenta. Ecke family sold out to the Dutch six weeks ago. It's no longer an American no company. I have no idea. So I have no idea how much it was sold for, but I tell you one thing's for sure. Paul Ecke III, who is a little younger than me, is about to get hounded by CSU Alumni Foundation. Again, guess who started the poinsettia bowl? Paul Ecke III. Guess what team played in the first poinsettia bowl? Colorado State University. I think we may have even won. I don't think we've won since then, but. <laughs> Prestige line. The Santa Claus line is a, came out of ball horticulture. All these have very similar genetics. All right. So that's my background on poinsettias. Probably spoiled it all for you. You'll never buy another one. OK. Poinsettias. It starts out with stock plant production because it's vegetatively propagated. Stock plant production is done primarily by uh, specialty propagators. Most of the primary stock plant production that's brought into this country as unrooted cuttings has now moved to places like Africa, Guatemala, Mexico, and the largest production area that's growing in size would be China. Stock plants, we establish, if you're going to, what a lot of growers will do is they'll bring in their unrooted cuttings and they'll get their stock plants uh, around March or June and they'll put them in the pots and they'll pinch them twice before they start taking their cuttings. This is if a grower is going to harvest his own cuttings, his or her own cuttings. Bench production, bot production, and the earlier that you start, of course, the larger the pot you're going to use. Um, some people start in a four inch pot and then shift them up because one of the biggest mistakes most people have, and if you've grown any house plants at all, you know the, the biggest mistake people make is to over pot their plants. You know, start your plants in too big a pot. So we typically start in a smaller pot and grow up to eight to inches, three weeks. We pinch when there's eight to ten, nine fully expanded leaves. And this is just a pinch schedule for harvesting your cuttings. Some growers will take these stock plants and then um, thin them a bit and then finish them out because they'll be in, in five to seven gallon containers for a premium market, uh, for the, um, uh, the premium market would be for churches. Um, that's a pretty comfortable uh, market that you can hit. Uh, if you're going for a Protestant church, they start putting poinsettias out uh, the first, first uh, Sunday after Advent. If it's a Catholic church, they don't put poinsettias out until Christmas Eve itself for the first um, Holy Mass. I do bring in a lot of uh, Christianity into a couple of our crops that we do because so much of our sales is based upon uh, Christian holidays. So we'll talk a little, we'll have to talk a lot about that with Easter as well. Potting media, anything for growing poinsettias is good for propagation. It needs to be well aerated, it needs to be cleaned or pasteurized. Uh, almost all the peat light formulations work really well. Um, we use a standard uh, feed, 250 to 300 parts per million, 212, just like everything else. 
However, uh, the, the modern data is now showing to decrease this by half and not leach as much. Or if you're irrigating with sub-irrigation systems, to definitely cut that by half. Um, poinsettias, their roots are sensitive to just about any fungus that you can think about. So most growers will start doing fungicide drenches to protect their plant material. Temperature, 65 degree nights, no lower for stock plant production. Temperature during the day, it needs to be less than 85. Now, if you're doing stock plants and the days are short, like if you start in the early spring, you're going to have to light them because poinsettias are photoperiodic. They're obligate photoperiodic plants, short days. Under short days, they will bloom. The critical photo period uh, for most poinsettias is about 12 hours, 15 minutes. We passed that point on the 19th of September. For those of you that are sad, who knows what sad refers to? Seasonal affective depression. Hmm? Extra credit. Extra credit, yeah. He's, he's digging hard. <laughs> okay. Now, some of the modern families, there hasn't been a study done on determining the exact photo period of the modern poinsettias to, uh, probably in 35 years. So most of, most of the data people are now looking at is, is all um, observational. So the different families, like some families are earlier than others. The, the Freedom family is earlier than um, uh, the V14s and the Equis point, the Hegs and such that is even later. So people will group them to avoid uh, the need for light. And in fact, there are a lot of people that have been, that have been shading their poinsettias probably as, as early as two weeks ago to hit that early market, because the early market Getting those poinsettias into the into the grocery stores before Thanksgiving uh, is right there, um, and if you go to places like Kmart, Walmart, places like they've already had the Christmas displays out. Yeah. So that's the typical stock plant production. A fast track production, comparing fast track, what we do is we're only doing one pinch. And this is for the grower that's probably not growing as many cuttings. What growers used to do is they used to do most of their own cuttings because they thought it was cheaper. Cuttings now today are so cheap that nobody does, maintains a lot of stock plant production unless they're doing large scale, large volume production. And fast track is just a procedure that you get things back. We only pinch them once, use a smaller pot, takes less soil, less cost. We avoid the overlap with bedding plant season because if we're starting our stock plants in March and April, uh, March and April, uh, we're taking away bench space that could be occupied by bedding plants. Bedding plants actually makes more money per square foot than poinsettias. Act, to be honest with you, poinsettias rarely clear a profit in a greenhouse. It's a break-even crop. If it's a break-even crop, why grow it? Any ideas? Why grow it if it's a break-even crop? Hmm? Make up for losses other places. Make up for losses other places. It keeps your employees employed 12 months. Because if you lose those employees during the fall, and we're talking primarily farm labor employees, they go somewhere else, they're probably not coming back. But if we keep them and we're typically talking Hispanics in this country, keep them until after Thanksgiving, keep them employed, even if it's a break-even crop, we're better off having those people come back after Christmas for a bedding plant season where we really make money. Because most Hispanics travel to Mexico or go home, or wherever their home might be. Um, I mean, there's a Hispanic population in Colorado has been here five generations in Southern Cal Colorado. The Arkansas River used to be the Mexican border, right? So when, just because somebody looks Mexican, they've probably been in this country longer than your family. <laughs> um, so they're, 
you're taking care of these people, keeping them employed 12 months out of the year. That's the goal. And you're paying for fuel, you're paying for upkeep of your greenhouse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So br even though it's a break-even crop, they still do it. OK, if you're going to bloom your stock plants out, make sure you only choose the best quality. And you want to make sure that you space them appropriately. And one of the things that I have found with growers that are growing out their stock plants, they tend to leave too much foliage on them, too many stems, and we don't get enough air circulation in the crop. And I've actually seen bread mold inside a poinsettia canopy, rhizopus. Harvest your cuttings uh, six weeks after your last pinch. That gives you a good sturdy stem. Uh, some cultivars a little faster. We want two to three cuttings, two to three inches, which gives you two to three mature leaves. Uh, they'll take the cuttings when they're turgid, cool them overnight, and so they get them warm, uh, get them full again to get the turgidity up. And then they'll stick the cuttings. And um, we only want to take the leaves off that, we're, that we don't want in the potting soil. We don't want leaves in the potting soil. And we're going to put in about tw uh, 12 stems per square foot. Most people, though, today are using uh, foam strips. And they or you orient them in such a way that the larger leaves are in between the strips because uh, we don't want the leaves to touch each other for bacterial infection. Points out is root in just about anything. Clean, free, contaminants. Pore space is important. Water holding capacity is also important. Physical support because we don't want them falling over. We don't want them saturated. If you're, if you're keeping your potting soil waterlogged, you're going to have fungus gnats. And like I said, most people are using root cubes or wedges. So here are some um, wedges um, in their preformed containers. Uh, these are typically uh, from the Oasis company or a foam. Um, here we can see this uh, cutting here that's wilting. That's actually Irwinia blight from the foliage touching each other. And that's probably the biggest problem we have. And Irwinia is a bacterial infection. And the easiest way to control Irwinia is to make sure your employees wash their hands and clean off the benches, et cetera, with a little bleach. Or uh, actually, you're supposed to use Green Shield or something that's registered for sanitation. They need a constant film of water on the foliage until they grow roots, uh, maybe even some night misting. Uh, we don't want it so wet that they get diseases. And also, a lot of leach, a lot of misting, if you're really pumping the water to it, will actually leach nutrients out of the foliage. Um, when the, the bottom of the stem starts to callus up is when we start to cut back on the mist frequency, because we want to drive roots. And we usually get cuttings and the, the cuttings will have callus on them within two weeks. Um, rooting hormone, they'll root with or without it. They'll root a little faster with rooting hormone. Uh, some cultivars are kind of a pain to root. Uh, the Monet family, uh, the speckled foliage um, poinsettias are typically harder to root. So they uh, will respond to a little bit of rooting hormone. And we use chloramiquat or cycocell to prevent the elongation or, st or stretching, because a lot of times what we do is not only will we mist uh, the plants, we'll cover them with a little bit of shade and cut down the light so they, they stay turgid and don't wilt as fast, which will create some stretch of the newly growing material. Because it's going to grow even without roots. It's going to start to grow actively <coughs> before it gets roots. Cuttings. We shouldn't have to feed cuttings if the stock plants have been well fed. Okay. Um, some growers will add a little bit of nitrogen and potassium to the mist for foliar feeding. It'll take it up in the foliage just a little bit, uh, no more than 50 to 100 parts per million. However, you only do this with highly pure water because any other salty water will cause a salt buildup because you're already putting a lot of salt material. So in other words, if they're doing foliar feeding, they're probably using RO water or something for a very clean source. As soon as root initiation occurs, as soon as you see a root, 
When the roots start to show, that's when the cuttings get hungry and we need to give them fertilizer. So the grower has to watch. And we're going to give them only 100 to 150 parts per million once a week. No stress, lots of space, get rid of the infected tissue, clean the dead leaves out, disinfection is, is key, employees, employee sanitation, fungicide uh, acclimation, those are your keys to success with poinsettia propagation. Now some growers will rent, uh, will root their cuttings directly in the container. It saves money, it saves labor, it saves a step. Less materials, less production time, fewer foliar diseases. However, it takes more space because rather than bunching all the cuttings together, we're putting them in bigger pots. Less poor space, it may not be ideal may have to wait for a controlled release fertilizer or something like that. Can you think of some other advantages? <coughs> Can you think of another disadvantage? What if you're putting multiple stems per pot? What if you're putting three pots, three stems in a pot? One dies. That plant is now worthless. Be more prone to overwatering. More prone to overwatering, exactly. So the critical thing with uh, direct, stitting, direct sticking into a container is you want to make sure all your cuttings are the same size for uniformity. Because if you have a little one and a big one, because everybody is going to use every cutting they get, whether they're big or small, they grow out of proportion. So you want uniform sizes for multiple cuttings per pot. You want to make sure they're mature, well-drained mix. You might have to go with a little bit lighter mix. It takes more water later in the season. Um, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, we want to make sure that we dibble the soil so we don't tear, tear, tear up the, uh, the stem. And we want to make sure that we don't waterlog the soil. Fungus gnats is going to be an issue with this particular practice and you're going to have to manage that fungus gnat population. Poinsettias need a, a high quality water source. Uh, clean as you can get um, because you're going to put water on the foliage and the medium. Um, irrigation frequency, I mean we can, I know growers that grow in all different kinds of pots, all different kinds of soil. Um, I have grown poinsettias in everything from high tech, high quality sphagnum peat moss mixes to shredded rubber to ground up butter tubs. I mean I have grown plants in just about anything you can imagine. My favorite is rice hulls. How much you use based upon this time of year. Newly transplanted cuttings, you may only water them once a week. Older plants, every other day, maybe even twice a day, depending on how big they are. OK, most of our modern peat light mixes do not have an adequate amount of micronutrients for poinsettias. So you need to use fertilizers that include micronutrient feed. Uh, your irrigation water may have it. Some of the newer fertilizers have it. But you need to make sure that you're applying micronutrients to the feed. And again, the 212 ratio is standard for poinsettias. Now, we're going to feed heavier at the early part of the season because we want them growing fast. And what most growers do for the first six to eight weeks of their cropping cycle is they use 20-10-20 to get their, their plants up and, produ up and growing during the vegetative stages. So the, that's during the point where they're not blooming. It's before flower initiation. Uh, we're trying to get good vegetative growth, okay? Then they'll switch right at flower initiation to 15515 CalMag to finish. Now, some will take and maybe alternate 15.5 with 15515, which is calcium nitrate, or alternate it. Can you remember what the differences are between 201020 and 15515? Can you remember early on in this semester? One's a 212, one's a 313. One's 212, one's 313, but what else? What is the one thing I want you to take home out of this class? You'll be asked at every test. 
What is it? 2010-20 is 40% ammoniacal nitrogen, 60% nitrate. 15 by 15 has even less ammoniacal nitrogen, just more nitrate. Okay, so this has got more, so we're using a high ammonium, higher ammonium fertilizer early in the season, and we're switching to a high nitrogen fertilizer later in the season for finish. Dark leaf cultivars, and we have light green cultivars and dark green cultivars. The dark leaf cultivars actually require less feed, okay? When finishing your poinsettias, when we start to see color, we're gonna cut our fertilizer in half. We're gonna switch to 100% nitrate fertilizer at that point. We won't even use 15 by 15, we use nothing but nitrate fertilizers. And two weeks before sale, we stop and give the, fer the plants nothing but clear water irrigation. And what that lack of fertilizer does is it intensifies the bract color. If you fertilize up to the point that the plant leaves the greenhouse in the, cons consumers, in the consumer environment, it will have a dull, lackluster appearance and it will not last until epiphany. We want our points that it's the last to epiphany. Okay, what's epiphany? A long time. Actually, at my house, <coughs> my boys, they get a present for the 12 days of Christmas. So, so if you're selling a plant, you're taking that plant at Thanksgiving, and you want it to last good until Epiphany, that's 12 days after Christmas. Okay? Um, I was just wondering, is the switch to nitrate fertilizer from ammoniacal forms just due to um, cooling weather conditions outside the greenhouse? Somewhat, but it intensifies the bract color. Okay. It intensifies the bract color. and increases the shelf life. So there's a, a plant with nitrogen deficiency. There's a plant with phosphorus deficiency, potassium deficiency, and you will see potassium deficiency in the greenhouse. Calcium deficiency, and I'm starting to see calcium deficiency photos coming into my office already. Calcium um, is taken up by the plant through mass flow. It relies on the mass flow of water through the system to distribute uh, calcium. And what's happening here is we're not getting good structural development of the vascular system. In other words, the, fo the leaf material, in the tissue in between the veins, in between the vascular tissue is growing faster than the vascular system and it shows this crinkled or Venetian blind effect. Later in the season during BRAC development, we'll see um, this, this burn. The BRAC of a point set has very, very few stomata. So it relies on root pressure to drive the water and the calcium into it. So some people will actually spray the foliage during, um, if we have a, a long, cloudy, cool fall or something like that, they'll start spraying their foliage to make sure they get calcium into the tissue, because you can have foliar apply calcium to prevent that problem. Um, actually, a guy sent me a picture on Facebook this morning of calcium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency um, is an easy one to fix. Um, the 15 by 15 CalMag, it was designed for poinsettias. It was designed with the calcium in mind, with the magnesium in mind, it's the correct ratio. Another crop that would benefit from CalMag is you, for the um, patio gardeners for tomatoes. Calcium deficiency, bract edge burn, and uh, the necrotic spot or the blossom, blossom end rot on a tomato is the same physiological disorder. It's a physiological disorder, it's not a disease. The disease that you see is the Irwinia infection from the damaged tissue in tomatoes. Magnesium deficiency is easy to fix with Epsom salts, sulfur, iron is common when the soil is cold, zinc, 
Um, molybdenum. We see molybdenum deficiency in Colorado pretty regularly because uh, with growers that are primarily using uh, mountain runoff water because there's no micronutrients in the mountain runoff water. And molybdenum, uh, in, there's no molybdenum in 2010-20, uh, which a lot of people use for stock plant production. So we typically see molybdenum deficiency in stock plants. Uh, molybdenum is responsible for an enzyme called nitrate reductase. So where we see this, this damaged tissue, if we were to analyze that, we would see lots of nitrate molecules in here with very little free nitrogen in the system. So we use ammonium molybdate in very small fractions in our systems uh, during stock plant production, or we just shoot it with a product called STEM. We can grow poinsettias in just about anything. Light, during the vegetative stage, uh, four to 6,000 foot candles is, is okay. That's pretty much full light in a greenhouse. Um, typically in the summer for stock plant production, we're gonna shade, but we're gonna take it off in the fall because we wanna have that bright light. One of the risky things about poinsettia production is we never know if it's gonna be a bright, cool, bright, clear fall or a cloudy, rainy fall. You never know. So you have to think, assume it's going to be bright and clear, but if you have a cool rainy session, you need to get in there and shade your crop. Quality. Um, preventing flower initiation, we use red light. It has more response, so a lot of people, we use incandescent lamps for keeping them in the vegetative stage. If the day lengths get short, if you want to delay past the flower initiation stage. Uh, fluorescent lights have very little effect on photoperiodism in poinsettias. They're a short day plant. Where are they native? Where are poinsettias native? Mexico. Central Mexico, south of Mexico City. Short day plants, if it blooms during the short days, what happens when it blooms and sets seed? What time of year is that when it sets seed? It's after Christmas. What's happening outside of Mexico City after Christmas. It's the rainy season. It's when these plants distribute their seed and that's what it's environmentally set up to do. That's the evolutionary. Typically, our photo period is, uh, our initiation date at this latitude is September 19th, typically. Some people consider that to be civil twilight. If you're gonna push your plants early, you've got to provide night cloth. And any stray light will disrupt flowering. All right. Night interruptions are the most precise for controlling bloom during our photo period. Okay. 45 degrees or cooler are gonna cause chilling injury so if you do buy poinsettias and it's windy and blowing outside, make sure you wrap them up. Um, night temperature higher than 72 to 75 is going to depreciate the quality of the bract. The optimum temperature is 60 to 80. The traditional temperatures for most production, 65 degree night, 75 to 80 degree day. And they do respond in height control very effectively to diff. Now, in fact, a lot of the diff research was originally done with poinsettias. Pinching. The modern poinsettias that we're growing today are self-branching, but we need to do a little pinching. Um, we have a couple of different pinches. We have what's called soft pinch, soft pinch with leaf removal, and then hard pinch. Uh, when we pinch, if we're growing small pots, four and a half inch pots, the little ones for that four and a half inch market, which is usually early season, we're going to do um, from the fourth node on six inch pots at the sixth node and seven inch pots or a greater we're going to do at the seventh node. Now we'll think of this as wherever we're pinching for every node that's going to be a branch. Okay? Now there's three types of pinches like I said soft, soft with leaf removal and hard pinch. They all have physiologically different um, practices. Now soft pinch we're only taking out the very apical growing point. 
and we're leaving lung, leaving young, rapidly developing foliage. Now, the soft pinch, because we have those rapidly growing foliage, rapidly growing leaves, they're generating hormones, they're generating auxins that are being translocated to the rest of the plant, and they're going to hold a lot of the plant, rest of the plant, a lot of the uh, lateral buds in uh, dormancy, okay? So it's going to inhibit lateral bud development. And typically, we do the soft pinch to get two to four laterals, and we're looking for a tall, upright plant. So we're actually thinking about, we'll do this for stock plants, we'll do this for tall plants where we're actually going for the church market or going for the interior scape market or something like that, the malls and places like that, to get a taller plant. And we'll also use it on short, weak plants if they're, if they're weak, you know, because we're going to use every cutting that we get. We'll do a soft pinch a little early, uh, right after we plant that rooted cutting, just to give it a little bit taller boost, to get it up into a more uniform height. Because the mass marketer, they judge their crop based upon a uniform standard height set by the Produce Marketing Association. Now, soft pinch with leaf removal. Soft pinch like before, but now we're going to take off those three to four rapidly growing leaves. Three to four, we're going to leave, take off those three to four rapidly growing leaves. So in essence, what we've done now is we've removed that hormone source. Okay? So it reduces the impact on plant development, and it eliminates that partial dominance gives us better light penetration into the stem with better plant development. And this is what most growers do today is they do soft pinch with leaf removal. And then there's the hard pinch where we're actually going in and removing a chunk of stem, not taking leaf removals, where we're looking at taking off one and a half inches of the total plant growth. Why, when do we hard pinch? when we forgot to soft pinch. Do they use that too to increase that uniformity? If there are some they will do it for shearing. A, a grower will do that for shearing if they're starting their crop really early to get a uniform height development after the stock plants have grown, after they've taken their stock plant cuttings. Okay, when the days become shorter than nights, that's when we have flower initiation. Long days, vegetative stage. Short days, of reproductive stage. You will see poinsettias listed in the, cal in the catalogs by response time. So if an eight and a half week response time refers to eight and a half weeks from flower initiation to anthesis, okay? And it's usually like in weeks. Scheduling, use the flowering response time and you work backwards. You want to schedule for an optimum development. Um, you can manipulate the photo period to schedule it somewhat. And of course, you look at your cultivar selection as well. Uh, pl final plant height, uh, vegetative growth, and time to flower initiation. We want our plants pretty much fully sized when flower initiation period comes. Six and a half inch finished pot, 16 to 18 inches, 18 inches tall. Uh, three weeks from time of finch to flower initiation. And this is basically, everything works backwards. Small pots are faster, of course. Product specifications, uh, the market uh, specifies plant height, pot size, plants per container. Bigger seven and nine inch pots usually have multiple stems per container. The market date, uh, these are all the things that impact how you're going to schedule your crops. Most of the country, 20 25th of September, Freedom and Pea Pride families, a little earlier. Late initiation, it can be delayed by excess temperature in the fall. And we want to make sure that you have enough time to get your height. It's hard to make up height late in the season. In fact, you cannot. Here's a typical schedule that people will use for this latitude.
and your crop spacing. Of course, the wider the spacing, the higher the quality of plant. A lot of growers will push them tighter to get more units per square foot and use growth regulators to keep the height down. Um, I can usually go through the greenhouse and I can walk through the, the box stores and the markets here in northern Colorado and I don't even have to look at the tag. I can tell you where each plant came from based upon their branching practice because they've been in all the growers' houses. And the stuff that comes in the box stores is grown locally. Uh, Non-branch plants, uh, there's some cultivars, especially, especially the, um, the real crinkly foliage ones. Uh, they'll grow as a, on a non-branch stem, grow them straight. Uh, for cut flowers, just like Paul Lakey Sr. did, um, they usually require a lot more production practices, a lot more space, but they get $10 a stem. Patterns uh, people use for plant symmetry. Um, they use patterns for like a six and a half inch pot if they're going to go to three inch blooms. Um, you want to get your plant symmetry. You want to make sure we're, we're the plant is fully developed because we don't want breakage in the shipping. And of course, increased uh, higher production practices. Foliar feeding, calcium is important. We use 200 to 400 parts per million calcium chloride um, and we spray it to glisten. Now what the spray to glisten means is we're just spraying it enough to make the leaf shiny but not where the leaf, where the, mm. the liquid drips off the foliage. Um, of course, spray injury. You want to do this primarily uh, from first color to anthesis because um, at this point calcium, calcium is not freely mobile in the plant. Once it's incorporated into the plant tissue, it doesn't move. So we need to make sure that the plant never loses a calcium source. Height control, plant growth regulators. Uh, most people use plant growth regulators, chemical plant growth regulators, or DIF. Um, brushing doesn't work with poinsettias because of the preponderance of breakage which causes latex exudation and crusting on the foliage. So we don't use brushing, we only use um, growth regulators, water or um, diff. So it's in control by temperature, humidity and light intensity. All the growth regulators work. Most growers use a blend of Cycacel and B9 early in the season and late in the season after they have bracket development, they'll drench with Bonsai or Sumagic uh, because you can apply Bonsai and Sumagic as a drench effectively during BRAC development. If you were to spray on B9 and Cycacel during BRAC development, the BRACs would be damaged and you won't get good BRAC development. Some schedules, B9 and Psychocell are tank mixed, Bonsai and Sumagic are drenched. Now, during flower initiation, like I said, um, we don't put these products on because it's going to reduce the bract size. And to prevent late stretch, especially if we're starting to see a cool season, and what we use is a process called graphical tracking which you're going to see here in a couple of weeks and as an assignment. Uh, we'll use graphical tracking to uh, predict our plant height. Finishing out our poinsettias, um, we want to keep our day temperatures cool because we get bracket edge burn um, and we want to make sure that we don't have cyathea abscission. When you're shopping for a poinsettia, the cyathea, the middle flowers, need to be strong, need to be firm. And in fact, I want them shipped pre-anthesis. Because when I shop for a poinsettia in the, in the store, I look for anthesis. And I want to see just a little bit of pollen shed, because that means it's going to last a long time in my house. 
And shading, uh, keeping the light intensity below 2,000 foot candles, or at least to 2,000 foot candles, will prevent scalding, because we don't want the bracts to scald. Shipping um, early uh, can be a problem. Um, this top picture, you can see that they were shipped too early. The, they had not hit anthesis, and the final bracts are starting to come out with some def deformed uh, bracts, not getting full development. And here uh, we can see where they're shipped developed. If they're too old, you're going to see cyathia drop, foliar disease, leaf drop, so forth. And in fact, uh, what we'll do towards the end of the semester will be, will be a fine time for us to do some, uh, like a Home Depot walk or something like that. And I actually know some of the places we can go and not get frowned upon um, by going and inspecting their plants. <laughs>